The Bible says that if we keep God's law in its entirety, yet break it in just one area, that we're guilty of the whole thing. Imagine God's Ten Commandments as a chain of ten links holding you over the flames of hell. How many one of those links would have to break for you to fall? Just one. How many of God's commandments do you have to break to be guilty before God? Just one. Just one. Well, who then could be saved, you might say? Those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your only hope. Your only hope. There is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved but Jesus. God's judgments are good. They're good judgments. They're for us. They're for our good. They're not burdensome. They're not to harm us. And perhaps, you know, this storm wasn't very bad, but perhaps in this time you, you begin to worry a little bit. This is what happens when storms come and hurricanes. People start to think, oh man, what if my house gets destroyed? What if I die? And they start thinking a little more serious about things. That's why after 9-11, I was up in New York. I lived in New York during 9-11, and the churches were slammed, packed with people. When death becomes on the forefront of people's minds, they go to the churches. The churches were full. But then time went on, and things went back to normal. You remember that whole never forget 9-11? Yeah, we've forgotten Most kids don't even know what it is. They're not being taught. And time, as we get further and further away from things, time seems, there's that saying, time heals all wounds. It's not true. It's not true. Jesus, Jesus heals. Jesus saves. Jesus is our hope of salvation. He's our only hope. The Bible says that there's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved but the name Jesus Christ. He's a Savior. He's a Savior. He's the Savior. The Bible says in Luke that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Imagine this, God creating man in his image, giving man free will to choose. Man chooses sin, man chooses rebellion, yet God still sends his son. You know the verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That same, that same chapter, Jesus said, you must be born again. These are the words of Jesus. You must be born again. A lot of people don't like that term, born again. We can talk about what that means, but Jesus says you must be born again. Then he goes on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Since God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world that the world through him might be, what? Saved. We have made a mess of this world. Yet God still desires to save. That's who he is. From the garden, we, I started off talking about judges. You know what God did for those people when they finally humbled themselves and called out to the Lord? He saved them. So what God does. He's a saving God. It's what he wants to do for you. Maybe you're like those people, those Israelites, where you just have a time where maybe things look like they're going well, and then you fall back into sin. And then you cry out to God, and then you fall back into sin. Is that your testimony? God wants to save you. He wants to deliver you from sin. He wants to save you from what? From your sin. That's what God wants to do for you tonight. He wants to save you from your sin. Salvation is not just a free pass out of hell. That is a benefit salvation Jesus came to save you from your sin this is why it's so interesting to me and sad how you have millions of Christ- professing Christians in America that don't look any different 
than the world. We have people all the time, this, and I'm not kidding you, this happens all the time down in Ebor, Ebor, drunk people coming up to me saying, oh, we're Christians, you know, but if Jesus, if, if we don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. Like they're somehow adding to God's greatness by sinning. No. It even says, shall we sin then because we're no under the law, longer under the law, but under grace? No, God forbid. This country is full of false converts. And you say, well, how do you know that? Isn't that judgmental? Yes, it is judgmental, but it's a good judgment. And God says how we know. He tells us how we can know if a Christian, a professing Christian is a real Christian or if a professing Christian is a fake Christian. So again, it's not my judgment. It's not something I'm making up. This is God's judgment. And the way he says for us to judge, he says that we will know a tree by its fruit. We will know a tree by its fruit. A good tree, he says, cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Very simple. An apple tree cannot produce oranges, and an orange tree cannot produce apples. And it doesn't matter what the sign in front of the tree is. You could go to a an orchard that's advertised as orange groves all over the place. There's pictures of oranges. They advertise it as an orange grove, and you show up there, and you look at the trees, and you're like, wait, those are apples growing. Those are apples growing. Those aren't oranges. Now, what would your judgment be? Wow, these, these oranges look, smell, and taste just like apples. No, you would say, wow, this, these people have the wrong signs. Or they're confused. That's what God says. That's what God says. He says this, now the works of the flesh are manifest or evident. They're clear. To manifest means to, to, to expose. The works of the flesh, they're evident, they're clear, they're manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There are things in God's word, God does not define what a drunkard is. He doesn't say if you drink X amount of drinks in a week, you're a drunkard. He doesn't define what a drunkard is, but he says that no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. We know that. And God has declared it, and God will be the judge of whether or not you're a drunkard. It doesn't matter what your psychiatrist says, or your doctor, or or Google, it doesn't matter what those things say. What matters is what does God say? And God says, if you're a drunkard, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on in, Gal in Corinthians, he describes, he, he goes another list. God is good to give us lists. He says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, who are the unrighteous, you say? Again, God is give, good to give us a list he says, be not deceived. That should be a, a red flag when you hear those words out of the mouth of Christ. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. A lot of these are the same sins. Nor effeminate, it's homosexuals, or abusers of themselves with mankind. These are sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous. You know what covetousness is, right, ladies? Covetousness, you know, when you look at that thing that your neighbor has. You ladies born again? Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Covetousness. America is full of covetousness. Looking at that thing that your neighbor has and just, oh, I just want that thing. Got to have that thing. Now, it's good. That it's not, there's nothing wrong with your your neighbor buying something so wow that's a really nice car i'm gonna work hard i'm gonna save up and maybe someday i can get that that's not covetousness you know what covetousness is you're not supposed to cover your neighbor's things his wife 
No covetous person will inherit the kingdom of God. What else? What else is on the list? Nor drunkards, again. Nor drunkards. Nor drunkards. It's amazing to me how much people in the professing church are playing around with alcohol these days. You'd think if God says that no drunkard is going to inherit the kingdom of God that you would not go anywhere near alcohol. That would be the wise thing. But now there's churches where this being debated. No, no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. Be careful. You know. You know you're a drunkard. Nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. God gives us a list. You know, remember when you were younger and you used to go to parties and drink and it was fun. God says sin is pleasurable for a season, but now you're older. Now you're older and what are you doing? You're still drinking, still getting drunk. Like a child. No drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. Man. So what hope is there? What hope is there? I'm, there's some lists on here that, I mean, to sum it all up, God says that for all have sinned. All fall short of God's glory. It says in Galatians, it says that the scriptures have concluded all under sin. It says even those back in the Old Testament that didn't, that didn't sin after the similitude of Adam. They're all under sin. We've all sinned. Sin entered the world in the garden and death by sin. It says by the, by the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. The world became corrupt through the disobedience of one man. But so by the obedience of one. The second Adam, Jesus Christ. One man sin, sin entered the world through Adam and death by sin. And Jesus Christ came and defeated sin. He conquered over it, says making a spectacle of it at the cross. He beat death. Oh death, where is your sting? You know the sting of death is gone for me. I don't care. I watched people lose their absolute minds during COVID. Absolutely lose their minds over something. Well, we're not going to get into all this, but really, I mean, it was a, it was the flu. But people losing their mind. Oh, I don't want to die. I don't want to. You know what we did? Nothing. We did nothing different except got to places faster because the roads were empty. We continued to minister. We continued to come out and preach. We continued to go to church. We continued to work. Why? Because death has lost its thing for the Christian. In fact, Paul said that he is, he is betwixt the two. He doesn't know. He wants to go depart. He wanted to depart and go be with Jesus. But he said, it's far better for you that I remain. Death has lost its sting for the Christian. This momentary, this light affliction, it says, which is but for a moment, worketh in us an eternal weight of glory. You know what the Christian goes through now? Is it easy being a Christian? No. Jesus said all those who live righteously in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Will, not might, will. It's not easy. It's not easy being a Christian. But it's a light affliction. And you know what that light affli affliction produces? Eternal, heavy glory. Temporary light affliction for eternal, heavy glory. That's a good investment. It's a good investment. A lot of people have been hearing this their whole lives. They're in their 40s now, their 50s. They've been laughing at the Christians. They've been laughing at Jesus now their whole lives. And they're getting older. 
and older, and death is getting closer and closer and closer. Will you humble yourself? There's a young man we met recently. He was, he's homeless. He was out on the street waving cars down begging for help and you know what I found I, I we've been helping him I got his name and I looked him up on Facebook three years ago he posted a picture of himself with the words unbreakable underneath it proud and here he is now no place to live waving down cars for any kind of help Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God says that he is near to those with a broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit, a humble spirit. We're told of two men, one that would declare, God, I thank you that I'm not as these men, and he'd point to these men, that I tie, that I do all this great stuff. And the other man, it said, he just wouldn't even look up. And he beat his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which of these two do you think went away justified? Which went away justified? The proud that was looking and pointing to his works that he had done? Or the humble that wouldn't even look up to God? He wouldn't even look up to God. And he beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. That's the testimony of every born-again Christian. If you've not reached that point in your life where you've beat your chest and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, how could you be saved? God is near to those with a contrite spirit, a humble spirit. Unfortunately, a lot of these churches now, they teach this false gospel that they'll hand you a card and they'll say, repeat this prayer and you'd be saved. As if God is just some... I don't know, I just thought like some Magic the Gathering card that can be unlocked with a certain words or prayers. No. You must come humbly before him and cry out to him Lord have mercy upon me what a sinner a sinner you know a lot of people profess to be pretty good people and certainly some people behave themselves more than other people for sure some on a social level are worse than others but God has concluded all under sin God has given us this book, the law of God. If you read in the law of God, it says that the law, it says in Galatians, is like a tutor or a teacher to show you your need for Christ. That's what the law does. It's like a mirror to show you that you're dirty. When you look at God's law, you said, okay, don't lie. And you look into that law, that perfect law, and you say, wow, I've lied. God says, don't steal. Oh, wow, I've stolen stuff. And stealing is not just breaking into a bank. Stealing is taking something that doesn't belong to you, whether you're stealing in your taxes from the government or whether you're stealing a pencil at work. If you're taking something that doesn't belong from you, that's theft. It's called stealing. And you look, you say, wow, I've done that. God says not to covet. We talked about covetousness. Wow, I've done that. God says to keep holy the Sabbath day. Oh, I've not done that. I've not loved the Lord my God. I've not honored his name and his day. And as you look deeper into this law of God, you see that you are dirty. You've sinned. You've broken God's law. Maybe you're not, never, maybe you've never been arrested. Maybe you've never been drunk. Maybe you've never done drugs. Maybe you've never done a lot of the things society does. But you've fallen short of God's glory, haven't you? Haven't you sinned? The Bible says that if we keep God's law in its entirety, it breaking in just one area, that we're guilty of the whole thing. 
Imagine God's Ten Commandments as a chain of ten links holding you over the flames of hell. How many one of those links would have to break for you to fall? Just one. How many of God's commandments do you have to break to be guilty before God? Just one. Just one. Well, who then could be saved, you might say? Those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your only hope. Your only hope. There is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved but Jesus. Some of you have heard this before. Some of you used to go to church. Some of you used to sing on the worship team and do your devotionals. And some of you used to really have a heart for God, but now you're caught up in the cares of the world. You're caught up with what your friends think. You wandered far from God and God is calling you to return. He says, come on to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you weary tonight? Is your burdens heavy? So what will you do tonight? The Bible says, if today you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. If today you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. I don't claim to be the voice of God, but I do claim to be declaring His Word. His Word for you, for me, His perfect Word. Tried seven times in the furnace of the earth. Perfect. Jesus came to save His people from their sins. Jesus died to save his people from their sins. And Jesus rose again the third day to save his people from their sins. And Jesus ascended up. He ascended up. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming again. When the Father says go, Jesus Christ is going to return in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and obey. Ooh, we don't like that word. And obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again. And he's going to make all things right. He's going to take. It says that with righteousness, he will judge and make war. Good, bud. Where will you be on that day when that trumpet sounds? The Bible tells us that there is coming a day when all who are in the grave will hear his voice. And there'll be this resurrection. It says the good unto the resurrection of eternal life. And the bad or the evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There's no such thing as annihilation. You don't just die and it's over. You're going to die and you're going to stand before a just judge. You're going to die and you're going to stand before a just judge. And what will you do? You know, oftentimes I've heard people use the analogy that it's like you're in a courtroom and you're standing before God and he's judging and then, and then, uh, you, you know, have no argument, then, then your lawyer comes out, and your lawyer is Jesus. I don't like that analogy. Two reasons. One, Jesus is the one that's going to be judging. The Bible says that all authority has been given to Jesus to judge. And two, Jesus does not come in. It's not like he's going to come in and argue. I know he's a bad guy, but, you know, we're, we're close. That's what lawyers do. They argue, and they, and they contend. That's not what Jesus will do for you if you're a Christian. Jesus is not going to argue your case. The way Jesus saves a sinner is when a sinner comes humbly to him, confesses that he's a sinner, turns from his sin, and puts his faith in the work that Jesus did on the cross. Now, I, I people tell me, oh, that's works. You're preaching works. Let me ask you a question. If you had your hands full...
you had your hands full, you had a soda in each hand, and I was to give you this free gift, what would you have to do to receive it? You'd have to put down what's in your hands to receive this gift. Re receiving a gift does not mean that you earned a gift. Your whole life, you've been a bir you've had birthdays and Christmas, and you open presents, and you're not like, I'm not thanking them. I earned this. I opened it. No, it's a free gift, but you have to receive it. And what does that look like? It looks like this. You humble yourself, you confess, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You turn from walking with the world, you turn from walking after your sin and the lusts of your flesh, and you turn and now you walk after Christ. Do you do it perfectly? Probably not. But God promises you that those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten, he says. I love the analogy. There's a preacher named Paul Washer. There's a preacher named Paul Washer, and he gives this analogy. He said, imagine you're watching a father, you know, a real grown man, a a farmer and he's it's snow on the ground and he's out walking around taking care of business and his little five-year-old son is following after him and you're watching from a distance and you're watching as the five-year-old is falling and tripping in the footprints of his dad trying to trying to walk after his dad is he doing it perfectly no he's not doing it perfectly but there's no doubt in your mind as you're watching this happen that that young boy is trying to follow his father And if, if, if someone cannot open the Bible and look at your life and say, yes, that, that person, that lady, that man is following Christ, it probably means you're not. Will you stumble? Sure. But there should be no doubt to those that are looking that you are following after your father. Is that you? Are you following God? Are you a man of God, a woman of God? Have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? Or have you just prayed a prayer and gone on living like the whole rest of the world? I have people all the time come up to me and try to correct me. You know the first thing I ask about them? I ask them, what's your testimony? And you know what? I always find out they're just wicked. I had a guy the other day come up to me outside Wawa correcting me about I don't even know what. I said, what's your testimony? He said, I don't give my testimony. He says, because you don't have a testimony. He goes, and he's, his response to me, I am so high right now. And yeah, I know you are. I can see it in your eyes. That's your, yeah, that's your testimony. The Bible says that Satan... Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses them day or night before God, but they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word, their testimony. Now you tell me if that testimony is going to overcome Satan. I prayed a prayer when I was seven, and I went on living like the devil. Is that testimony going to overcome the devil? No. No. The Bible says that we have a baptism that saves. We have a baptism that saves, not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience before God. Who can ascend into the hills of the Lord, but he who hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully? He shall receive blessings from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of our salvation. Are your hands clean? Is your heart pure? You know, the Bible tells us about these two people. One was a pharaoh and one was a king. Perhaps you're familiar with Abraham. You know the name Abraham. Well, he had a wife named Sarah. And twice, Sarah, uh, Abraham lied about Sarah, saying that this isn't my wife, this is my sister. Why? Because he was afraid that Sarah was such a, a beautiful woman that he was afraid that these people were going to kill him because to get to his wife 
Well, the first place this happened was Egypt. Abraham lied about Sarah in Egypt, and a great judgment came upon Egypt. A great judgment came upon Egypt from God because of the sin that they were committing. And they finally worked it out, and Abraham went and prayed to God, and the, and the judgment ceased. Well, then later, they go and they do the same thing to a man named Abimelech, King Abimelech. But nothing happened to this man. And he had a dream. And God revealed to him that Sarah was Abraham's wife. And, God, and Abimelech said, with the integrity of my hands and the innocency of my heart have I done this thing. What does that mean? That means he was innocent. His heart did not have any evil intent. His hands were innocent. And God said, yes, because of the integrity of thy hands and the innocency of thy heart, I have kept thee from sinning. Can God keep you from sinning? Absolutely, he can keep you from sinning. If you have integrity of hands and innocency of heart. I've experienced that so many times in my life. I've gotten to the point now when something seemingly bad happens, I'm just like, praise the Lord. God's doing something. God's working. But don't think that you're going to just be living in a wicked lifestyle of sin, that God's just going to keep you from sinning. No. God's going to give you over to that sin. That's what it says. Perhaps you know what that's like. Maybe you're going through that right now. Scary place to be, that sin that you're in. Seems less and less bad, doesn't it? When you first started it, you, were, you had a guilty conscience, which, by the way, your conscience is given to you by God. It's knowledge of the law. God has written in your heart. And you started that sin, and you had a guilty conscience. You knew it was wrong, and then you continued on. The Bible says that your conscience can become seared. Seared. Maybe you guys have cooked steaks before and you sear the meat and you seal the outside of the meat. So nothing can come in and nothing can go out. That's what God says could happen to your heart. Your heart can become seared. Maybe it's happening to you right now as we, as we preach this message. Don't let it go all the way. We had a gentleman not too long ago down in Ybor City. I gave him a track. Two hours later, he comes out of one of the bars. He ended up going home. He said he knew he shouldn't be there. He said, the first time you talked to me, I felt like I was Peter and the rooster crew the crowed the first time. He said, I wasn't going to let it get to a third time. That's the decision that you need to make. You need to say, no, no more. I'm not going to run from God anymore. I'm not going to live after myself anymore. I'm not going to satisfy my flesh anymore. I'm going to live for Jesus. God will bless that decision. The Bible tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Well, let's see. How was it in the days of Noah? How was it in the days of Noah? It says they were eating and they were drinking. And they were marrying and they were giving in marriage. What does that mean? It means they were just living their lives, not concerned about anything. And it tells us that violence was on their minds continually. And sin was so bad in the world that God destroyed the world with a flood. You say, you really believe that? Yes, I do. I do believe that. I believe everything in the Bible. Everything? Yes, everything. And God destroyed the world through a flood, except for those that were inside of the ark that God had Noah build, the ark of salvation. If you were in the ark, you were safe when the judgment of God came. If you're outside of the ark, you were not safe when the judgment of God came. What did you have to do to get in the ark? You had to hear the preaching of Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness. You had to believe that judgment was coming. You had to believe that you were going to perish in this judgment, and you had to get in the ark. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is the ark of salvation. If you're in Christ, you'll be safe when the judgment of God comes. And he said that he will not destroy 
the earth by a flood again, but with fire. If you're in Christ, you're safe. If you're not in Christ, you're not safe. What must you do to be in Christ? You must hear the preaching. You must believe that judgment's coming. You must believe you're in trouble without Jesus Christ. And you must get into Christ. You must turn from walking after the world. And you must enter into a relationship with Christ. That's what you must do. So make tonight the night you make that decision. Don't put it off any longer. I urge you not to put it off any longer. Some of you all have been putting this off so long. Maybe you feel defeated. Maybe you feel like you've just done this so often. You've, you've come to God so often in defeat and in sin, and it just seems like he's not hearing you. Well, do it again. And humble yourself. Go to him again. And again and again. Keep. Keep going to Him before you get cast into the lake of fire where there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. For the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. Why will you be weeping and wailing your gnashing your teeth, sir? Because you'll be angry with God. You see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, and you yourself cast out. You believe the false gospel. Don't put it off any longer. All those people that mocked Noah for building that ark, all those people that mocked his preaching, oh man, when that door shut, when God shut the door of the ark, and those flood waters rose, they weren't laughing anymore. They weren't mocking anymore, but it was too late. You know, it says in Revelation that God is going to do things to this world that makes that would make the, the most creative sci-fi writer tremble in his boots. Horrible things. It says men will seek death and will not be able to find it. And you might think, okay, then people are going to humble themselves. Nope. It says men will still not repent. Maybe you're saying, oh, God, I, I'm just not ready yet. I just need, I, you know, my life's too good still. I'm just not quite ready yet. It doesn't work like that. Get ready. Make yourself ready. Humble yourself. Cry out to Jesus Christ before it's too late. You know, not too long ago, there's a sinkhole swallowed a man up. Can you imagine that? That man, who knows? He's probably just laying there, and all of a sudden, boom, swallowed up by the earth, dead. Maybe he was saying, oh, I'm just going to, I'll get right with God tomorrow. I just want to, I just want to smoke this joint. I just want to smoke this weed. I just want to drink this beer. I'll get right with God tomorrow. And then he's swallowed up in the earth and he's dead. Today is the day of salvation right now. Don't put it off. Humble yourself. Come talk to us. We'd love to show you in God's word how you can be saved, how you can know says in 1 John, these things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. You can know it. You can know it. Choose this day whom you will serve.